happy to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am a native New Yorker. I was born in uh, Brooklyn. I grew up in Queens. And now I live in Manhattan. So I'm hoping to hit Staten Island and the Bronx sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm going to read a few pieces from my memoir. Uh, uh, if you've read at least the first um, chapter, you know that I have a, a disability, cerebral palsy, and it affects me in many ways, one of which is my speech. I speak with a disability accent. Um, uh, usually it's comprehensible, but occasionally I go off the deep end and you may not understand me. If that is uh, the case, please uh, yell at me. I respond very well to yelling. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I really want us to communicate. Okay. All righty. So. <clears throat> The first piece is called Close Encounters with the Clueless. What's wrong with you? You're so inspirational. Were you born that way? Are you sick? Is she sick? Is she, you know, slow <clears throat> or drunk? A bit too much Chardonnay, perhaps? You're so courageous. If it were me, I'd never leave my house. I'd wish I were dead. If you could choose, would you be normal? I mean, even though you do so well. Do you live with your mother? Do you work? Can you have sex? Have you ever had a boyfriend? Was he a cripple, too? Or a saint? What a shame. Such a pretty girl. You're so brave. Aren't things better now for the handicapped? Uh, this piece is called The Stare. I feel her eyes before I see them in that coffee shop around the corner. My second home with its gray and white formica counter and rickety red stools that have horsehair stuffing peeking out, scratching my thighs when I'm foolish enough to wear a short skirt. Every morning, corn muffin and coffee. No need to order. George, the waiter, sees me meandering in and thrusts the muffin on the grill while he pours just the right amount of milk into my coffee cup, knowing my shaky hand, a badge of cerebral palsy, has a poor track record as likely to douse the counter as the coffee. I look up my sense of comfort shattered by the face across the counter that wants me gone, her eyes glaring, filled with fury and disdain, watching my involuntary movements, my limbs and facial muscles dancing without my consent. <clears throat> imposing on them her own fears and fantasies. Her lips contort in ways that mock mine, mumbling words of disgust to a non-existent neighbor on the next stool. George, always the good observer, gets between us, coffee pot in hand, engaging her in idle conversation to give me a moment to remember who I am. I overhear her longing to live in my area, Greenwich Village, and her conviction she could never afford it, 
when I, a long-time resident, jump in, offering her guidance about how to get cheap sublets, knowing she has little chance of success. Not in my neighborhood. The news that I am a native with a rent-stabilized apartment, no less, transforms me from a freak to a friend. Not exactly a gift as I become prisoner of her compensatory banter about her mother who had a stroke and who, she insists, shakes worse than I do. And isn't it amazing that I can do so well living on my own in a neighborhood most people would die for? As the telephone talk continues, I debate whether my role as educator has to begin at breakfast when all I want to do is to enjoy the sweetness of my corn muffin and shoot the breeze with George. Uh, you know, I have a little request. I don't know whether anyone has uh, a bottle of water. Sorry. Okay. I'm doing fine, but it's then some point I may not. Uh, this piece is called Driving High. When in my early 20s, my mother announced that she was giving me driving lessons, our family doctor did not approve. He said he'd be afraid to be on the road with me, given my disability. So take the train, my mother suggested. <laughs> I, too, had doubts about my driving, but these had little to do with my physical limitation. The image of myself as a driver was incongruous with some internal experience I had of myself, of needing to be cared for and directed, of not being able to be in the driver's seat of my own life. There was something, something comforting and familiar about being driven around, of being picked up and delivered. Some of my fondest childhood memories were adventures in which my mother was behind the wheel packing me shopping in some exotic store or to an out-of-the-way restaurant. My preference for passenger status held fast, even though I was otherwise radically independent, stubbornly making my own life decisions regardless of what anyone thought. My mother recognized this incongruity or lapse in my independent self, and she sought to remedy it by insisting that I become a driver. Although it would take her several years of coaxing to overcome my resistance, she was persistent. She understood the dangerous consequences of surrendering to the impulse to let others take charge. My mother was strong and feisty and in many ways epitomized the independent woman. But when it came to family decisions, she often so come to being submissive and a good girl. This is partly how she came to find herself living in unfamiliar territory, far from friends and family in Queens, New York. In this situation, learning how to drive, largely without the blessing or help of my father, was her salvation. I remember my mother's stories of how she conquered the gray 1951 Oldsmobile in our driveway. After my father went to work and we went to school, 
She would slowly back the car out, careful to avoid decapitating the red and yellow tulips around the edges of the lawn, and then practice right, left, and U-turns in the tree-lined neighborhood streets now devoid of school children. As she described it, parallel parking was the trickiest to master without the help of an experienced pair of eyes to guide her. But she would pick her victims carefully. Already bruised cars, but wouldn't mind another notch on the offender <laughs> should she miscalculate as she maneuvered to park behind them. Our neighbors were far from pleased. I'll call the police if you don't stop driving without a license, the woman living next door yelled. I'll mind your own business or I'll report your son for playing hooky with my mother's immediate response. For her, taking on the police force seemed less daunting than being imprisoned in a less than stimulating neighborhood. She secured her license only after repeated trials, and then the world was hers. Have you heard from mom? Became my father's most frequently asked question as we waited for her to show up hours behind schedule to cook his dinner and behave like his wife. After learning to drive, my mother was eager to teach others in need of liberation. I was her most resistant pupil. I finally succumbed to her wishes when faced with the challenge of renting a car in the British Isles during an upcoming vacation with a childhood friend. By then, I was in my late 20s and living in my own place in Manhattan. My parents had left Queens for a new house in Long Island. It was a grandiose idea to think I could drive on the left side of the road when I had not yet conquered the right. But I was still young and eager to please my license-lacking traveling companion who had lived in Scotland and promised to show all if I could do the driving. My mother seized her moment and showed up at my doorstep two or three times a week for almost two months to give me driving practice. I remember almost knocking a bus once and driving the wrong way down a one-way street. But none of my misjudgment seemed to face my mother. She showed fearlessness and perfect confidence that I could do this, I would do it, and I would like it. The promise of a delicious steak dinner at the end of each session and her unshakable will got me through those initial near disasters. As skill replaced images of myself lying dead on the highway, I was surprised to discover an amazing sense of mastery and freedom emerging. Why, I could drive myself anywhere in the world, not dependent on anyone else's desires or whims. My fantasies started nationally as I imagined driving to New Mexico to the eyeball of magnificent red, orange, and purple sunsets while pretending to be Georgia O'Keeffe <laughs> or journeying to Cape Cod off-season to talk with the ocean and walk naked on the beach. Then I became more expansive, driving to kiss the blinding stone. I also imagined speeding past our family doctor and giving him the finger. <laughs> As I shared with my mother, tentatively at first, my newfound sense of freedom, and began reeling off all the adventures I might undertake, she shrieked with pleasure and said, let's go. Her enormous enthusiasm surprised me. I suppose I had feared abandonment. That should I, her youngest child, 
become truly independent, she would become distant and disapproving. But clearly, she would not let me go so easily. When I got my license on the first try, we celebrated with steaks. But as dessert, she insisted on teaching me how to get on and off the Long Island Expressway so I could drive to her house. The trip to the British Isles never materialized, but it had already served its purpose. When I drive now, more than 35 years later, whether on expeditions to freedom or journeys to fulfill burdens and responsibilities, my mother is always there, calming me in stalled traffic beckoning me to undertake outrageous adventures and warning me against the temptation to be a passenger in my own life. This piece is called Keeping the Distance. Time out for a clean up the job I've just created here. <laughs> Keeping the Distance. During my reading of Women's Studies class, an effort by the professor dear friend of mine, to infuse disability into the curriculum, I look up to see one of the students, a young woman, crying. I have been telling a tale about my mother teaching me to drive. My mother's persistence and insistence, despite my resistance, makes everyone laugh except the student. My mind is flooded with questions. What do you see or hear that transforms a typical mother-daughter tangle into a tragedy? Surely you, barely 20, still struggling to escape your mother's grasp, know all about the maneuvering imaginations of mothers and their defiant at times desperate borders. Have you pushed me away, turned me into an outsider? The grip of girls' triumphs over adversity, driving despite her disability? Or is it the presence of the crippled girl herself, her odd movements and halting voice that evokes your tears? overpowering the meaning of her words. How can I convince you that the tragedies of my life have to do with commonplace disappointments, disillusionments, and losses, the lover, the job that got away, the death of someone dear, not disability? Perhaps I can't. You need to keep me at a distance as though I were contagious. To see me as a sister scares you, shakes you, shocks you. Then I would be like you. And what's worse, you would be like me. Better you should see me as courageous. It makes me cry. And this piece is called, I'm Not Looking in the Mirror. How do you know how you look if you can't see yourself in the mirror? A stupid question for me to ask a blind friend. Others on my mirror, she explained, telling me if my makeup is smudged or there's a glaring stain hovering over my right boob. We both laughed. 
But I thought she was lucky not to have to confront that internal, eternal judge at each encounter with the looking glass. At least she could choose her judges and moments of condemnation. I don't know why I'm always shocked to see myself in the mirror. Full body or headshot for me in the mirror doesn't seem like me at all. Surely after 60 years of myriad mirror encounters, I should know what I look like when I encounter a stranger each time. Who is that woman walking in such a graceless way with her knees and toes turned in, head and chest bent forward, body off balance, ready to trip over a crack in the pavement, an unnoticed step or nothing at all? Surely not me. Why can't I claim her? Why in my mind's mirror do I see myself walking like every woman, like any woman, like, but, like anyone but this woman? I'd never walk gracefully, never stood tall, erect, with toes pointed out, despite the prodding, pleading, cajoling of rehab doctors, physical therapists, dance instructors, and even a famous model turned charm school director. These were all my mother's recruits hired to normalize an abnormal walk that wouldn't concede. My mother's lifelong wish for me was to walk straight normally once she was assured I could walk at all. Born with cerebral palsy, I was a disturbingly late walker. But once I was up and more or less running, my mother found my towing in, my awkward gait more distressing than any of my other imperfections, disability related or otherwise. She insisted she did not want me to suffer like her childhood friend who was only slightly pigeon toed yet teased mercilessly. Maybe the truth, maybe a cover for her sadness and remorse over birthing a disabled child. Through much of my childhood, she kept the full length mirror in the basement and with some regularity would make me practice walking normally in front of it, attempting to craft a graceful girl from a crippled daughter. She met her match with me. I tortured her back, refusing to practice, insisting that my walk was normal enough. Not that I couldn't see the difference, my difference, but amidst my girlish green dreams, my love affair with punch ball, Nancy Drew Mysteries, and the boy who lived down the street my imperfect walk was easy for me to overlook, a minor part of who I was. For her, it was all I was, the telltale sign of defects. Why couldn't she see all of me, I wondered. Why can't she love me just the way I am? We declared a truce, the mirror tossed, but my mother ultimately won. As I grew up, I absorbed her vision of me as defective. Even now, although my mother is long deceased, with each encounter with the mirror, I see myself as she did, feeling her shock at the pigeon-toed girl, doomed to be tormented by the world's stairs. On that score, she was right. Strangers and even friends don't look kindly on clumsy girls, whatever the source. The walk becomes the woman, and all else is lost. How can I claim that girl in the mirror as me, not some shock-producing stranger? I buy a full-length mirror, not to please my mother, although she would be pleased. Not to fix myself, but to find myself. With focused attention, 
I walk up to myself repeatedly as though to make that stranger my friend. I get to know my walk with every twist and turn and off-balance step as really mine, or so I believe, until I'm call, caught off guard, walking past the mirror without intent, mine elsewhere, and the defective stranger reappears. Maybe she's here for good. Maybe I need to make peace with her. One day, I approached my reflection in the large store window of a Japanese restaurant on my corner and news whether I will encounter a stranger or a friend. But my musing is interrupted by a woman begging a frequent inhabitant of the block. Why do you walk funny, she inquires. A familiar question more crudely put than most, one that during childhood would have sent me home crying to my mother. A perfect moment for my mother to coax me down the basement to the mirror. From some unconscious place, I find myself responding, my crotch itches, and we both laugh. As my eyes now turn toward the store window and my reflection, my crotch itches becomes my mantra. The absurdity of the words somehow dulling the shock value of the unfamiliar image I see before me. I can't say that I'm ready to claim that stranger, that gimpy girl who walks funny, but somehow she seems ever so slightly more recognizable, more acceptable. The image no longer only has an association with defect. I have created a counter story, perhaps equally absurd, about a girl with a cunt that has been overactive and now she is paying the price. It's not the story I want to end with, not the real story about the complicated woman who is an activist, artist, lover, friend, sister, troublemaker, and oh yes, has an odd walk. But it will take this woman a while to learn what the little girl knew and forgot. In the meantime, I'm trying to be kind to strangers. And I have one more, and then I'll shut up, and hopefully you'll talk to me. Uh, this piece is called Sylvester, and it mentions uh, someone by the name of Jean. Uh, Jean is my life partner. Uh, Sylvester. Sunday ritual. Jean, side, and Jean and I side by side in bed a stack of DVDs at hand. As the movie marathon begins, Sylvester, Jean's big, boisterous tuxedo cat, stakes out his claim, leaping over Jean's body onto mine. He decides where to flop slowly, testing out my stomach, boobs, shoulder, and thighs for just the right combination of meat and bone. He sits, curls, or sprawls without regard to whether his tail is in my face or his claw in my ribs. I am his chase lounge, there for his comfort. His presence, his preference for my body, tickles me. It also terrifies me. My body is in constant motion, especially when I'm lying down. I'm at my own mercy, watching myself shake with no ability to stop it. Surely I could sh stop shaking if I really tried. A childhood myth perpetuated. My shame pervades. 
during sex, I wonder how my lover will react. One is supposed to lose control through orgasm, not through a body wandering willy-nilly. My partner's reassurances are not convincing, a problem not unique to me or my palsied body. As Sylvester lies on me in perfect stillness, dozing off, my shame impedes my pleasure. Will my movements shake him into wakefulness? Will I hurt him, pinching his tail now lodged between my thighs, or his pink nose snuggled between my knees? Will he abandon me for Jean's more dependable body? My fear intensifies the movements. I panic. Sylvester does not. My jerking movements cause him to shift his position ever so slightly and resume his sleep. When I pull away my leg, now cramping, he finds another available body part. <laughs> there is little my body can do to dissuade him, except sneezes, jeans or mine. Those will send him off the bed, running for cover, only to return a few moments later to reclaim his chase lounge. Gene jokes that Sylvester always chooses me. His teasing is tinged with jealousy. He claims that Sylvester prefers my body precisely because of my movements that he finds them soothing, like lying on a waterbed. <laughs> An intriguing notion to be chosen for a bodily feature that has been a lifelong source of rejection. Sylvester will not confirm or deny the theory. By picking me, whatever the cause, Sylvester has reduced my embarrassment about my body. Better than psychotherapy. Cheaper, too. <laughs> Maybe defect differences doesn't matter all that much when it comes to being lovable. Maybe we can all be the cat's meow if we choose the right cat. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to stop here and uh, give you a moment. And invite questions, comments. I'm going toward the students I know prepare discussion questions. <laughs> Who's going to start? Right back there. Ah, okay, Pam. <laughs> I'll start you all off. <laughs> Hello. How are you? So uh, I'm taking a writing course now, and I'm curious, where do you write? Do you enjoy writing in solitude? Do you write at home? Do you have an office? So I'm very interested in where people do their writing, because it's so from the heart, and it's so... It's comical. I mean, it's just great. Thank you. I uh, you know I've written in a number of places, but for a number of years, while I was working on this book, I went to a place called the Writer's Room. It's a place where uh, everyone is writing, and you get a desk there, and there's a... Um, uh, you know, I tell them, like, no, I don't talk, and all electronics, you just have to sit there and write, or sit there and pretend to write. <laughs> um, and that was a very sort of, uh, 
It helps to have a community of writers somewhere, if not literally someone to write with and literally someone to read to or to get support from. Uh, so that's what I do. And then I do a lot at home at my desk. Try, uh, but it's harder to discipline yourself at home. There's the phone, there's the laundry, there's, you can find a lot of excuses. <laughs> Writing is hard work, it really is. Getting exercise in there. This is my exercise for the day. <laughs> Hello. How did you choose what to put in your book? Because there's such a, you know, the articles that we read, there's such a, a variety. So was there a certain way you went about choosing what you actually put, what experiences you put in your book? Well, I had some help with that. I mean, I, when I was writing... In the, in the writer's room, I didn't necessarily have in mind to write a book. I was just writing on topics that were meaningful to me. And then when, I, on, when one of my co-writers suggested that I really had a book on my hands, then I had to decide what I was going to include. And it wasn't necessarily easy to do that. Um, but there were certain themes that kept emerging, and so I used the themes as some sort of heading for sections, and they helped to screen, screen out some stuff. And then when I was fortunate enough to get a publisher, uh, the editor there had a lot to say about what to include <laughs> and, what, and what was not there yet, but I needed to be there. So. It was sort of a give and take um, kind of process. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to ask. Good thing. Hello. Uh, what would you say is your biggest motivator to write your book? What got you started in writing? What got me started was um, actually my mother. My mother had, I, you know, I had always written professionally. I was a social worker and a, a disability advocate, and I did a lot of professional, quote, writing. But what got me sort of started in personal writing was that my mother had died, um, and she had gone through uh, several years of illness and unhappiness. If you, if you read more of the book you have sent from, my mother was a tough, feisty, active woman. And in the uh, end of her life, the uh, she had been ill, and she was quite depressed and angry. And when she died, it was like she was not the mother I knew and who had been such a strong influence. So I started to write, and partly to recapture the mother who, who of my earlier years, who had, um, and by goodness knows, she was not perfect, but she had a lot of energy and, and feistiness that I greatly admired. So I started writing a piece about her, or a few pieces, and uh, I realized, as I, and she reappeared, you know, the mother who I remembered reappeared in those pieces. And but sort of through that, I realized what a, a powerful tool writing can be, because you can really use it to explore your feelings and to change your feelings about things. So I began writing about other topics that were sort of loaded for me or difficult for me, many having to do with uh, my disability and attitudes toward it and the oppression that I faced. And 
I am sort of kept going because I saw it was a way to have a, to give a voice to some of my feelings and to transform them. How has your image of yourself as a disabled woman changed over time, over your lifetime? In 25 words a lot. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I, um, I spent many of, my, many of my early years until maybe I was 30 or 45, sort of in the closet. I mean, I, I really did not talk openly. I knew I had a disability, I mean, uh, but I never talked openly about it. I never acknowledged it. I never wanted to be seen with anyone who had a disability or so. See, I, and truthfully, I didn't, even though I didn't acknowledge my disability, I, I, it had an impact on my sense of myself as a woman. I didn't feel very womanly. Um, for many years. I think a number of things sort of helped to transform it. One was that I got involved in a women's consciousness raising group in the 70s and I uh, discovered that many, many of the ways that I judged and disliked my body were not unique to me or to having a disability. Virtually every woman in the room hated her body one way or the other. So I discovered that I had a lot of commonality with women, and that sort of helped me get a firm sense of my identity as a woman. And then I got involved um, in the disability rights movement, I sort of started in a self-serving way. I wanted to become a therapist, and in New York City there are six zillion therapists. <laughs> so unless you have a specialty, you're, you have no chance of ever getting clients. So I got this bright idea I was going to become a therapist for people with disabilities which was totally ridiculous because here I was, I was in the closet, I mean, so deep in the closet, you could hardly see me. I had this cockamamie idea that I could help someone who had a disability. It was totally absurd. But, but that was my thinking. I don't know. It sort of got me to, and of course, in order to get disability is less clients you have to meet them I, I didn't know anyone with a disability so I began going to groups you know we sort of the start of the disability rights movement or meetings and organizations and I, I would go to those thinking I'm going to recruit all these great clients but really what, what I was going to do was transform my attitude to a disability because many of the people there were smart and funny and, and interesting and They sexy. recruited you. Hmm? <laughs> they recruited you. Yeah, I guess, I guess. And I was, uh, on one side, I sort of found myself in a community of people with disabilities who, who I really liked and admired. It was much easier. I mean, I was glad to claim that identity well, glad might have been too strong at the time, but I was working toward claiming it as a positive part of myself. What do you think about the title of my book? Why do you think I chose that title? Thank <laughs> you. Um, I don't particularly know why you chose that, but um, it has been something of my interest. Um, with social media, as we all know, as a young population, you see a lot of times um, 
I discussed this with actually my fieldwork supervisor that you see pictures of people with disabilities and it's like, if he could do it, you could do it, you know? If, exactly, right on, you know? But it's really just that person living their lives, you know? They're going through and they're walking out in public. That's, okay, why is that inspirational? You know, like, I'm doing things that are my daily life activities. So I think that maybe had a connection, but that's kind of how I started perceiving those images that I see all over social media and, you know, even in posters in hospitals and things that... Some people may think you're in, you're putting people with disabilities like, like oh great, great, but really it's like I'm just living my life. <laughs> I've had long thoughts about the title. Well, I'm some of you know with the title. What do you mean? Don't call me inspirational. <laughs> I teach in this area. I teach? Nope. Oh <laughs> talk. Talk. Anyway. <laughs> That's okay. I, don't think I can make it. <laughs> I teach in this area, and I teach online, actually, also. We just had a, uh, you know, an essay about these kinds of issues in sport. And I actually go through and circle every single one that says inspirational in the uh, essay. Uh. And I think it's like 98%. You know? <laughs> and it's, you know, we try to do readings, and this is graduate level too, so we try to do readings that are about identity and about uh, socialization. How do you, I don't know if you even have the answer, if anybody has the answer, how do we change that? How do we get to the point where the first thing out of our mouths are not, oh, you're so inspirational. I look at how well these people have done. You know, how do we change that? When some of them might be real jerks. You know? <laughs> not inspirational. <laughs> Right. You know, a disability thing. doesn't guarantee uh, Exactly. Anything. I think it's making disability mainstream, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's not, if it's not, people aren't calling attention to something like that, then it's not inspirational anymore. You know, difference is what makes inspiration, right? Some, yeah. I, I mean, I said. certainly, I think that would certainly help. I think that some people have a real attachment to the... I mean, I had done many readings on this book, on this book, and the title is done Call Me Inspirational, and I cannot tell you how many people come up to me after and say, oh, you're so inspirational. <laughs> you should get it. You didn't get the title. I mean, <laughs> I think uh, some people are really wedded to that image, and I, it's uh, partly, I think, for their own needs, you know. I think underneath it all, it's not a positive message. It is sort of, um, it's based on the assumption that if they had a disability, they could never make it, so anything you do is great. I mean, I, I get called inspirational when I'm in the supermarket buying Cheerios. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Big time, but I think oh, I think it's really a challenge to to let it go that it has a lot of meaning for others who are not disabled, and we're, we're gonna we have a lot of work to do. I mean, that's not to say that some people with disabilities are not inspirational. No, I mean, there are people with or without disabilities who inspire us to important things. That's mine, but not for buying Cheerios, for God's sake. <laughs> no? <laughs> it lets them give it some meaning and ground and well, own contributions to society, not, on, not, not hiding in the closet, you know. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to, yeah, I don't know what works. You probably get it. <laughs> oh, wow. Ooh. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say about the inspirational thing. Uh, I was talking with Harleen and I showed her, this is the book. <laughs> okay, and uh, each of these yellow uh, thingies is... Uh, is pointing to a part which I found, kill me for that, but inspirational. 
uh, <laughs> a lot of that. But I found an inspiration in, in terms of you as a disabled activist um, and m me being involved in Poland in disability activism. I mean, I, there, there are many things that I can learn from, from, from what you have been doing, especially in terms of addressing the issues the taboo issues such as the sexuality of uh, women with disabilities. So in that sense, I think it's fair to say that I do find you an, an inspiration in terms of disability activism. So just as a footnote. <laughs> I'll try to forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Anyone else? Eric. I, I agree with you. I do find you inspiration as well. So you have two people to forgive today. Um, but in this society that's so divided, as we can see, is what's happening now with the acceptance of certain communities. And your message is strong through your readings. Can you tell us who you're reaching with your message? Is it everybody? Is it still divided for you when you um, promote your your book and your <coughs> studies? Oh, well, uh, oh, you know, you often don't reach people oh, who most need your messages. My hope was that the book would reach both people with and without disabilities and people with and without a direct um, involvement in disability issues. I think I've done I, I think I've done better reaching those with disabilities and those involved in the field of disability. I think there still remains I mean I've caught a few who are more mainstream and really have no connection. But I think still that disability is a taboo or, or not a sexy or not a topic of all jumping to run out and run hear, hear readings about. Uh, so that barrier uh, remains. Uh, that's why I'm always more inclined to encourage disability to be included in a larger framework of oppression uh, and identity. Um, because you reach more people who don't know that they need this kind of uh, education. Yeah. Yes, but you, you tap into so many areas in your, your book. There's so many things. There's sexuality, there's activism uh, for disabilities, activism for women, and there's so many areas that you really, you cover ground. So I would think that, even though I understand what you're saying, you know, you're, you're hitting an audience that works with people with disabilities and the disability audience, I would think that it would probably spread wider than that, you know? Well, you know, that is my help, hope. <laughs> you want a job as my person. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the reality is that when you have a book with the word disability on the cover, there are some people who just don't stand away. Um, for fear, for discomfort, for a whole host of reasons. But yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, it has a broad range. And I mean, what woman could not identify with body image or a number of the issues? Uh, but there still is a real hesitancy to, to just see that as something relevant. Hi. Hi. So. I agree with what Mary was saying, and I kind of wanted to piggyback <laughs> off of it, <laughs> because uh, as I read the passages, I, I mean, just so you know a little bit about us, we just finished up, you know, three clinicals, um, and what I thought back to was when I was working with the mentally uh, ill, or people with mental illness in that population, they would tell me a story that they were, you know, dealing with in their life, and then they would end it with tying it back to their, their mental illness. And my reaction was like, well, but that's not your mental illness. That's completely separate. And I think that the passages that you wrote about for 
for example, that population and every other population, especially in um, the one, I think it was well, the passage about walking straight right. with a mirror. Right. It raised the question, I think, and it does it for everybody. It's like, do you love yourself enough to stand your ground or do you love yourself enough to change yourself? Because there were so many, in my eyes, like as a coming from a clinical perspective, there are benefits, you know, to like physical therapy and having them coming over and for posture and joint modes and, and all that stuff. So that's kind of the, like, this isn't really a question, it's more of a comment, but that's the aspect I was kind of attacking because even thinking, for me, it was like, this is my human nature to root for you. And then my clinical nature to be like, well, wait, there's also that aspect as far as your own health goes. So even, you know, being part of this profession, that's where it, you know, it challenged me and reached me. I really don't know many people with disabilities besides, I guess, you know, the clients I've worked with, so. I mean, the, the key thing to think about, I think, in your profession, it was very grandiose. One, one thing to think about is it's fine to get physical therapy very helpful as long as it is the person's goal. Right. You know, I have to think what they want in their lives and what would be most helpful. And then absolutely, more often we sort of get fit into, you know, molds of how we're supposed to be. I, I agree with you about loving yourself enough to accept yourself, but I don't know that we necessarily foster such self-love in our education systems or in our country more broadly. You know, I don't know that that kind of real deep self-respect and appreciation is such, uh, such a value, given enough value here. It's more competing and getting better and that kind of thing. Um, this is kind of related to what Alex said, but as future clinicians, we're taught that we're supposed to practice client-centered care. Um, I, as I was reading um, one of your passages, I noticed that Mainly it was your mother's motivation that she wanted you to walk better. Um, and that's why she brought in the physical therapist. It was more her choice than your choice. Do you think that if it wasn't something that she seemed to be forcing on you, that you might have wanted to work on your walking? Or was that just something that you had no interest in at all? You know, I think a lot depends on how it is presented. You're presented as having something wrong with you. And if you're stubborn, like I certainly was, well, there was a real resistance to accepting that label and then having to fix, be fixed. I think there's a way to present, you know, um, <coughs> You can, uh, there's ways to prevent, to offer um, therapies that it can be seen as uh, meeting people's own goals, even kids. But my, my mother had more the defect model, and I couldn't, have, I couldn't hear it from her. Maybe I could have heard it from a, a different approach, um, maybe. But also, just remember, I was in the closet, deep in the closet. So if you're not acknowledging disability publicly, it's hard to get you to therapy. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So your answer may, this past answer may answer this one. But okay. um, in your writing, you use the word crippled a, a few times, which nowadays is kind of like a politically incorrect Phrasing. So I was just wondering what was behind your thought process to use that as opposed to another word. Well, uh, you know, um, one of the things 
I wouldn't recommend you use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll get you in big trouble. I think part of what some of the disability community is trying to do is to reclaim negative language and use it as a source of in your face, Bella, you know. And so uh, it's a, sort of with, the, with that spirit that I use the word. Uh, I certainly don't use it on a regular basis to identify. But some people, I mean, some call them, we, we talk to each other as scripts and the sort of language that it's sort of an in-group kind of language, and that's fine. I mean, but it's sort of limited to those within the community. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so kind of going back to what you were saying before, um, did you feel like um, your ex experience with um, driving, how your mom kind of wanted you, it seemed like, from what you were saying, it seemed like your mom really wanted you to do it more, and then over time, she you kind of got the motivation for it because there was something you wanted to do with it. Do you feel like that if um, they kind of applied that same thing with the walking, like giving you more of a task or more of a goal that you would have wanted to do it more? Or do you feel like it was just a diff it well, was approached you know, differently? I, I think it's a complex. I mean, very first of all, in New York City, you don't have much need to drive. So it was not... It's not a big time activity that every kid ha has to do. I think I was also afraid of I was going to really kill myself or some horrible thing was going to happen to me. So it was an element of fear. I mean, my mother, unlike my walking, my mother never really shoved it down my throat. She was very encouraging and she taught many members of my family. So I didn't. I didn't feel real heavy duty pressure from her. But when a situation arose that I was really motivated, then she jumped right in there. And I'm actually very glad driving is a very freeing uh, experience. And I've loved it since I've learned that I would never have known that. Uh, but it had to come from me. And she knew that it had to come from me. <clears throat> Other comments or questions? Or? Oh, I have another. <laughs> There's nobody else. Where is she? I'm wondering if you're sensing, if you're getting um, readers who are other sort of parent-child dyads and whether you sense that, that things have changed or is it the more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, I have um, a neighbor who has a child who has CP and I, you know, despite the, the generational differences, I could feel, you know, I can feel that he's in the closet in a certain amount of ways and I, and I feel the pressure on him to conform his body and um, and I can feel how you know how linked his mom and, and he are and also her drive to you know um, to support him in excellence in the areas where he can be excellent you know okay. so I, I was just curious what you think That's about that hard to say I mean we certainly have more laws now than the neighbor parents to get more for their kids. I think most parents want to want to get whatever they can for their children. But, you know, no parent is, is taught to how to raise a child with a disability. I mean, the parents have a certain expectation when they are pregnant and then have a baby and they're not really prepared for a difference that I didn't anticipate, and so it is a learning process. I mean, I, and I think it would help parents if they had access to more adults with disabilities who are leading interesting lives, then they might be less inclined to, um, to mold them into normalcy and see that the kids can have 
to uh, their children can have a perfectly good life as they are a full, rich life. And, but I don't know that that message has gotten across. I don't think the parent community and the adult disability community have come together enough to make that happen. Um, so I think in some ways it's still, there are still lots of parents who are seeking to normalize their children, not for bad reasons. I mean, they assume that that is the only way their child can have a, a rich and full life. Um, uh, and there's no question that disability and prejudice is still alive and well. And when you have a visible disability, it's true, you're going to face more prejudice. prejudice. And parents would have, in some ways, like to protect their children from that kind of prejudice. Better, they should have a more open conversation about how the world is, how we live in a prejudiced world, and here's what you might face, and here's how, how you can handle it. But there's not enough of those kind of conversations. <clears throat> Any other burning or unburning questions? <laughs> okay. Well, I wish you all well, whatever careers, whatever your studies are, um, and I appreciate your questions and comments. <laughs>